All right, 931. Let's kick this off. Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Federico Cherovsky. I'm the managing director of Quorum Cyber, uh, and this is our first Azure Security Clinic. Uh, so I'll tell you a little bit about what the plan is for today, but also what the plan is for these clinics. So we've been working with Microsoft for the last four years in the pretty much defending organizations, right? So we use all our skills and our knowledge and our teams to defend organizations against uh, cyber attacks. Uh, and we do that either through professional services or managed services. In that journey, we've started in the four years, we've become, uh, we've adopted all of the Microsoft technologies as Microsoft was releasing them. And uh, we ultimately launched a security operations center. Uh, I think we were the first one as, 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 so far uh, I've heard within Microsoft that was using only the Microsoft security products. We weren't using any traditional scene. Uh, and on the back of all that, a lot of knowledge starting being accumulated where as Microsoft released new capabilities and as we were working closer to the technical teams and the dev teams in Microsoft, we started incorporating all of those technologies uh, into the SOC and into the managed services. Uh, and it, it ended up being that we were able to articulate a lot of that value back to customers in a way that, that hadn't really been kind of collected before. Uh, so that's where these clinics, uh, the idea of these clinics was born. Uh, we wanted to, to show to customers that it's not just the, the service, but each of the component pieces of the Microsoft ecosystem are kind of key in providing the end-to-end -end protection uh, that that customers need right now and that we are able to articulate as a managed service, but for some organizations we might not. Uh, so we really wanted to start these clinics as a way for us to start sharing the knowledge in each of the specific products and then to actually make it more collaborative. So we want to engage with customers and customers with everybody in the community that is interested in each of these capabilities to kind of join in uh, and, and start having discussions around what's working well, what's not, what questions they have, what situations we've seen where we've done something cool with the technology uh, and really start to talk about the benefits of the whole ecosystem as opposed to just one individual product. So this is the first of these uh, these events that we're going to hold. Uh, we're already planning the next one, which is going to be on things like Microsoft Cloud App Security, uh, Azure Identity Protection and Information Protection. So stay tuned for updates because because we'll, we'll on the back of the feedback from this one uh, and based on the other topics that we know we already want to talk about, we're already planning the next one. So so the first kind of ask of everybody is use the Q&A panel in the in the, in the in Teams because you can raise questions there. We will be picking up questions throughout the different presentations and then we'll do a massive Q&A at the end for anybody that wants to jump in. The agenda for today is pretty quick and pretty simple. Uh, first of all, we'll have Blair Lockery from Microsoft. He's public sector CTO for Scotland, uh, talking a little bit about what Microsoft is doing uh, in the region and how they're looking at the ecosystem. And then we'll jump straight into three technical uh, demos. So this is PowerPoint free from, from our perspective. Uh, and it's purely on, on demo environments to try to show you how each of these components, Azure Security Center, Defender ATP, and Azure Sentinel kind of all play together in delivering cybersecurity services. So without further ado, uh, I will hand over to Blair. Blair, this is all yours. Thank you, Federico. Good morning, everybody. Uh, hopefully you can hear me okay. Uh, take it we can see that okay now. Yep, absolutely perfect. Okay, well, uh, good morning, uh, Blair Lockery. I am uh, Microsoft's public sector CTO for Scotland. Uh, grand job title, uh, not as grand a job. Uh, so essentially what I do is I provide uh, our technical strategy uh, and support to our, our large uh, public sector uh, customers here in Scotland. So anything all the way from, from health, and you'll have seen a, you know, a, a hell of a lot of work happening with uh, our colleagues at NHS over the last uh, few weeks, uh, all the way through to the, the larger of our uh, local government, our, our councils uh, across across Scotland. Uh, beyond that, I work with uh, various different Microsoft partners, uh, helping to, to, to help strengthen our relationship, uh, work together on uh, opportunities uh, where we can help support partners who are, are making use of our Microsoft technology stack and indeed uh, on the reverse, uh, stand strong uh, with our partners when they're they're working with our customers to ensure that we're delivering a joint message. So I just really wanted to start off uh, today uh, talking a little bit around about Microsoft and its, its approach to partnership. Uh, I imagine many of you on the call have, have worked with Microsoft technologies for quite a while and will be fairly 
uh, familiar with the the model uh, that Microsoft sells through. But essentially, we are we are a business that is you know massively, if not fully, dependent uh, on a on a strong, vibrant uh, partner ecosystem. Uh, and I'm uh, I'm personally delighted to to be on the call this morning, uh, supporting Quorum Cyber, Federico and the team here, uh, because one they are they are a Microsoft partner uh, that are are using the best in breed. Uh, of Microsoft technologies, and and that's fantastic to see, particularly in this cyber uh, security space, as Microsoft has grown uh, as a as a as a cyber defence company uh, over the, the last five to, to six years. Beyond that, the fact that they're based in in, in Central Scotland uh, is is of great delight to myself and. Uh, and my colleagues uh, from the from the Edinburgh Microsoft uh, office, and and we are really uh, excited about the the coming months and years working with Quorum Cyber uh, in partnership, uh, helping uh, deliver the best of Microsoft technology into their customers, uh, and working with them to ensure that our customers have access to their consultancy uh, and where appropriate the managed service. So it's a big thanks for me uh, this morning uh, to to Federico and the team. Uh, delighted again to to be working with Quorum Cyber. So, in terms of what I wanted to cover uh, this morning, uh, I'm going to try and keep this as, as product light as possible because uh, I'm going to leave that to the real experts uh, once I finish up. Uh, but what I really want to talk around about is some of the, some of the key themes uh, that we are seeing uh, globally, indeed, uh, around about uh, cybersecurity. And I think actually, Rather than speaking around about security to start off with, it, it's probably more appropriate to actually talk around about what is happening, you know, globally from a business uh, point of view, how companies are having to change, how they're having to flex, how they're having to to, to be more essential to keep uh, to keep the pace in a, a competitive landscape. And a Microsoft term that that, that our leader uh, Satya Nadella uses quite a lot is that every company. Uh, is now a, a technology business, right? So whether you're a manufacturing firm, a professional services firm, a retail firm, a huge amount of the, the business that you do uh, is technology. Now, whether whether that's shown at the forefront of how you interact with your customers or it's really just, you know, at the back end in terms of how you run your operations, how you engage uh, with your workforce and the tools uh, that you supply them to do their work. But we view that everybody uh, is having to build their own digital capabilities. They need to make the best use of data uh, and they have to transform in such a way that they're they're using the same technology that their competitors are or indeed they're they're procuring a data and, and enhance technology that allows them to gain that competitive advantage. So we see every technology every company as a technology company and thus we don't believe that you know the conventional security tool set can keep pace with that, you know. So, what used to worry a, a business 20, 25 years ago uh, is completely different from a security posture point of view. Now, we are increasingly having to think around about how does a business take its identity into the world? How does it interact with its suppliers, its partners, its customer? And we're having to secure at that edge, no longer a traditional, you know, ring friends approach to we are a business and we want to keep ourselves secure. So in this kind of what we call as a, an era of flux and transformation, uh, the pace of change is, is massive. Uh, and, and we are finding that traditional security tooling uh, is unable to keep pace with that. So really looking at siloed endpoint solutions uh, for security and technology uh, leaves you in a, in a position where you're, you're constantly having to catch up, you know, and changes in your working environment, changes in the technology that you're implementing. Uh, we find that working with a, a span of different uh, conventional tools uh, is, is causing blockers to, to that transformation uh, because there is a, a lag or a worry uh, that, that things aren't quite keeping up there. And look, security professionals alone uh, are only, you know, their, their knowledge, their experience, uh, you know, dealing with these situations are critical. But we find that actually coupling them with the, the best in class tooling, uh, the best in class technologies where you really garner a benefit. And, you know, indeed talking to talking to the team at Quorum Cyber, I think they've got that that pretty much locked down uh, from from both angles in terms of their vast, rich security uh, experience. Uh, but then coupling that with, a, you know, an enhanced uh, future forward uh, technology tool set. And look, the, the last thing, and, and I, I spend pretty much 
you know, at least half of my working time uh, with, with public sector uh, organisations and regulatory requirements are, you know, probably 90% of our conversations uh, at some points. And that's very much around about, you know, data, uh, data as a currency, data has a, an immense value, uh, but it also comes with an immense responsibility. Right. So in terms of holding data around about your, your organization, your partners, your, your customers and being able to secure that data and make sure that it's used for its intended purpose uh, and, and isn't compromised. That, uh, that is probably one of the key focal points of, of, of regulations that are coming down the line. Uh, and Microsoft, uh, along with our, our, you know, our partner network, are, I think, in a, a fairly unique space uh, to, to assist our customers with making sure they're getting things right in that space and uh, ensuring that they are protecting uh, their data uh, going forward. So I just want to, want to talk a little bit around about how how these streams of data have changed, right? So often when I'm talking to customers, uh, I, I try and do a little bit of a raise hand uh, exercise and that's not going to going to quite work today uh, as we're in this virtual environment. But what I'm kind of looking for is, you know, how many how many tech technology devices do you actually have as a as a person, right? And I'm I'm sitting at my kitchen table right now because I've been uh, I've been uh, evicted from my office because my my wife is also working at home and and she's she's quite uh, quite happy to use uh, my monitor and keyboard setup from there. But even just looking at my kitchen table, right? I am looking at the the, the main device I have in front of me. Uh, I'm looking at the laptop that I've got uh, alongside that. I've got a mobile phone that I use for work and personal uh, because we use a bring your own device uh, model. Uh, I've got a wearable on my wrist, if you can see that. Uh, and then if you look above me, I've got, uh, you know, smart speakers connected, you know, so I've just listed, you know, four, five, six different devices that are actually within touching distance of me. And that is really not anywhere close to the amount of technology gadgets and, and gizmos that I've got laying around about the house and, and that I use for, for my work. So when we are talking around about the, you know, security landscape uh, and how we need to think about how we protect our assets. Uh, it's a lot more complex than, than it used to be, right? It, it's, it's a lot more driven around about, you know, what identity do I bring onto these devices? What data follows me as I move from my, my, main, uh, my main device for work onto a laptop, onto a mobile device? These are the questions that, that really need to be answered and, it, and it's no longer just appropriate just to lock down one single device for a user and, and make that almost a, you know, a safe zone for, for all their data and, and stop any data bleeding from that edge. Because in a, in a pursuit of, uh, you know, a data rich environment and, uh, and collaboration, both internally in an organization and with partners and customers, we actually need to span uh, across a number of devices. And that really leads us to thinking around about how do we bring, uh, bring all these uh, repositories of data together? Uh, how do we make sure that we can put in technology uh, and 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 process that actually protects all these things and that under a single lens uh, as opposed to to risking something actually falling outside uh, of that of that ring fence so we we see and and it's, it's it's no mistake that this all forms into a nice cloud shape but we see uh the the cloud has been pivotal to uh to ensuring that we can help our customers make this a simple process uh, make it a, a quick process and make sure that actually it scales uh, it scales to our customers needs right across all their their digital devices all their all their ways of working all their ways of interacting so I'm just really quickly uh, quickly going to touch on this and I'm not going I'm not going to labor this point too much uh, but but what we are seeing is an increasing trend to Microsoft security stack uh, moving from kind of mid uh, mid position uh, on uh, on what what Gartner called their their magic quadrant uh, and really starting to to double down on the on the capability and uh, the the reach of our tools and, and seeing them now fall increasingly into that 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 magic uh, top quadrant on the on the top right hand side and and this doesn't happen uh, happen by mistake and it doesn't happen overnight either uh, this is a long uh, long hard fought journey. Uh, to build out the, the capability of Microsoft tools. Uh, 
integrate them seamlessly uh, with our cloud technologies. So our, our free main public cloud. So, you know, your Office 365, Microsoft 365, Dynamics 365 and our, our public cloud uh, platform for hosting uh, Azure. So we have spent a, a tremendous amount of money on research, implementation and change. Uh, both from a Microsoft point of view, but also working with our strong security uh, focused partners in this space uh, to really build out our, 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 our technical skill set and our, 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 our products uh, in this space. Uh, and, and we're now beginning to see the, the fruits of that labour uh, as we see uh, young innovative uh, partnerships with, with companies and some of our larger mainstay uh, security companies coming together uh, to utilise these technologies for, for our customers' needs. It's something I often uh, I often get asked is you know what makes what makes Microsoft a, a security company? If if I was looking towards uh, implementing sec uh, security technologies, why would I why would I look at Microsoft? Right, Microsoft provides you know a lot of my services. They provide Windows, you know, a SQL uh, Server, and uh, you know I may have made that that move to to Office 365 and I, I might be hosting some of my uh, technologies in, in Azure or, or I might have moved to a CRM system on on, uh, on, on Dynamics 365 and actually for me it's it, it's fairly simple uh, when I think around about the reach uh, of our, our global consumer uh, and commercial cloud services Microsoft has probably got one of the largest uh, attack, uh, attack surfaces uh, globally, uh, in terms of how we need to respond to uh, attacks, uh, and and, uh, and 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 as the guys here at Quorum call them, the bullies uh, from a global scale. Uh, just looking at our our, our, our daily uh, ingestion of data across the, the Microsoft Cloud globally, there's some striking numbers here. Uh, for instance, you know the 1.2 billion devices that we scan each month using our ATP products. Uh, the 400 billion emails that are analysed as they enter into uh, Office 365, uh, and and uh, the 18 uh, 18 plus uh, billion Bing web pages scan. So, our our technology is working on the commercial side and and, and actually being out there uh, day after day, uh, getting exposure to these threats and 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 learning from those threats uh, and making sure that we've got the best information to act. Uh, if we look on a on a on a consumer side. Uh, we also run uh, one of the largest uh, gaming platforms uh, worldwide, Xbox Live, and uh, we've got we've got a huge amount of resource and experience on on public-facing uh, uh, mail platforms such as you know MSN.com, Hotmail.com, and, and and now the the rebranded and, and reinvigorated Outlook.com, uh, where we bring together those Microsoft accounts so that single consumer identity that. We're now seeing people use for education at work, uh, but also at home for their personal needs with email uh, and and uh, and music and technology and, and that sort of stuff. So I, I, I truly believe that we've got a, a a massive a massive attack surface, which gives us a, a unique ability uh, to be able to analyse and 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 understand uh, what is happening uh, out there in the world in terms of in terms of threats. Again, these are these are some of the the five key points that, that we, we believe are around about uh, a requirement in terms of protecting your assets, and we always start with identity. Uh, and and again, just some striking numbers around about uh, you know the running into the billions of vulnerabilities that we discover uh, daily uh, across our, our customers, and, and then help fix through our technologies, and indeed the malicious and suspicious messages that that we've blocked in 2019 alone, which is just a, a staggering amount of data that is flowing through Microsoft uh, that we we're, we're able to leverage on on our customer and, and partners' behalf uh, to, to to help secure uh, their environments. I'm going to touch really briefly on some product. Uh, I think I'm I'm okay for time, uh, but what I'm, I'm certainly not going to do is is do a deep dive uh, into all our technologies because I'm I'm going to leave that to the to the show and tell session uh, coming up from the the team at Quorum Cyber. Uh, but one I did want to touch on uh, based on today's conversation is is Microsoft Defender ATP. Now this is a product that's went through. I think many different iterations, and indeed, I was having a, a conversation yesterday with a customer who are who are looking to 
to do two things. They're looking to, to make a make a tactical decision around about uh, endpoint protection at this point. Uh, but they're now being, you know, they're they're conscious that every decision they make at this point uh, has strategic uh, strategic implement uh, um, implications as well. Uh, in terms of if they they tie themselves to an endpoint solution, what does that mean for their ability to capitalize on the the strength of the Microsoft uh, cloud as they move forward through a you know a large scale uh, Office three six five migration uh, in in the coming year? So. Every time we have these sorts of conversations, we are we are we are one foot in the in the immediate from a tactical point of view of what you need to do today and where you need to to focus your attention. Uh, but we've got a real firm gaze on where does this customer actually want to end up long term as well uh, in terms of their their security footprint across all of their uh, all of their data, all of their identity, all of their devices out there. So we we do often we we do often start with Microsoft Defender ATP. You know, we 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 recognise it as a, an award-winning uh, protection de and detection uh, capability. Uh, as industry leading, uh, I I touched upon it on the, on the Gartner uh, slide earlier. Uh, but but where we we think this gives a, a huge huge amount of advantage uh, is actually the the methodology that we we utilise uh, from a, um, an automation point of view. So using AI based uh, investigation uh, to do that automated you know uh, sandboxing of uh, you know, suspicious threats into an environment so that we can we can sign them as as being malicious or actually give them approval to move through. And that's that's something that's that's quite unique to our product set and, and fairly seamless uh, as an experience for an end user. Uh, what we don't experience through our through our products is those those constant uh, needs to to run uh, run signature checks and, and download the latest binaries uh, on a client by client basis or push them out uh, as a cloud based cloud powered uh, capability uh, natively integrated uh, with with the Windows stack and, and increasingly available uh, across our public cloud platform for for Linux uh, and and PaaS services. So. Really exciting technology, really uh, something that we start with on a lot of our conversations with customers and uh, how that then integrates into the wider security uh, service, uh, particularly on our, on, our, our, on our compute elements, so onto our public cloud uh, is, is a real advantage as well. So utilising Azure Security Centre uh, as, a, as a, a pane of glass product uh, to allow our customers and partners to take action uh, across their estate. Uh, in terms of the threats you see. So we, we're probably going to touch on Azure Security Centre today as well uh, from the team at Quorum. So really excited to see them uh, dig into that uh, and, and, and show some more. One, uh, one of the last kind of technology elements I want to touch upon uh, is a product called Azure Sentinel. And I don't think we're, we're talking about that in depth today from the Quorum team, but I think it'll, it'll, it'll probably come down the line. But this is this is our, our cloud native SIEM solution, uh, which which allows you to integrate your 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 full technology stack into a single area, uh, so that you can take uh, you can take action uh, on on any potential threats uh, and incidents uh, across your environments and. And it's been something that's been in the works for for for, for quite some time. Uh, we we obviously do have a, a rich uh, competitor landscape in this in this space. Uh, you know, competitors such as, as Splunk and such, but we we believe the time is now right for a, a cloud native uh, intelligence team uh, in the marketplace, uh, and we are absolutely delighted that we've been able to bring this product to market. Apologies, that's my my washing machine in the background. Uh, we've been able to bring this technology uh, uh, to our public cloud uh, and 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 allow our customers who are already. Uh, in that place with Office 365, with, with Azure and the security centre, uh, you know, with Dynamics and, you know, utilising a Windows 10 estate uh, and the Defender products to actually surface that information, but also uh, a huge amount of other sources into a single cloud base uh, tool uh, and then really actually use the, the power of the cloud and, the, you know, the scale of the cloud to, to do a lot more with that information, right? So not actually, not actually, uh, Bringing it right down to individual uh, incident investigation by a, by an end user, but actually using the, the automation, uh, the capability of the Microsoft Cloud and AI uh, to take action uh, to, to to carry out sensible 
uh, first steps on that information to actually shape it uh, into a form where where experts such as the, the team at Quorum Cyber can take immediate action on that and actually uh, you know respond to uh, a, a threat or an incident before it actually takes hold uh, within a customer environment. So we're seeing you know a huge trend in some of our, our large uh, Azure uh, based customers are, 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 are signing right up to Azure Sentinel because it, it makes a lot of sense in terms of where they host their estate and where they're working with Microsoft technologies. Blair, just to, to comment on that, uh, we will be covering Sentinel today. So I'm doing um, the last technical session of, of the morning is actually uh, half an hour in Sentinel. So hopefully if you stick around for that part, uh, we'll get to cover that in, in more detail. Oh, fantastic! And and look, I'm I'm only one slide away from being a blocker uh, to those demos. So the only thing I really want to touch on here is around about some of Microsoft's security advantage. And I, I did speak around about you know the billions, and then indeed the slide says trillions. That must be adding them all together uh, of of diverse signals that we see across our our public cloud, both consumer uh, and commercial. Uh, our annual investment in cybersecurity uh, has has risen year on year and we're we're now uh the you know the one billion dollar mark uh, on an annual uh cycle uh, of investing in cyber security and and i do think that is likely only only to grow we we actually within microsoft have over 35 uh 3500 global security experts uh and then we you know we augment that massively uh with our rich and diverse uh partner ecosystem uh, teams such as as the guys and girls at, uh, at Quorum Cyber. So I'm delighted that we are we are in a position we are making a, a massive uh, investment uh, in, in security products because we think it is, you know, it's base level zero uh, for for any modern uh, organization, particularly those that are moving into the cloud. Uh, and I, I'm doubly delighted that we're we're in a position we can work with with partners such as Quorum Cyber uh, on on their customers uh, and their experience and their technology uh, augmenting what Microsoft brings to the party. So with that, uh, I think I've got two minutes left. Uh, I'm more than happy to, to take individual questions, but again, I'm going to be sticking around uh, for the, the full of today's session and, and more than happy to pitch in as we get to the latter stages uh, and, and do that Q&A. Thanks, Blair. Uh, there is one question that I published in the Q&A from, it's more a comment, I guess, but you might want to you might want to chip in there before we move on to the next slide, uh, which is from Andy L saying, it's, it's basically a comment on the rate of change. It's great the capability that's coming to to the environment, but uh, there's a there's a perceived disconnect, and I'm, I'm very cautious with my words here, uh, uh, with the rate of change versus keeping customers informed and making material available, for example, for people to be able to leverage the new capabilities as they're as they're published. I mean that's partly the nature of the cloud, right? So we're doing rapid deployment. There's no longer version updates. Things just become available. Uh, couldn't possibly comment on the rate of change of your naming conventions or, or pricing <laughs> packages. Uh, maybe that's for a different different side of the, the evening. Uh, but uh, do you want to do you want to chip in there with, with it, it, what's what's Microsoft's uh, kind of official view on how do you manage change versus how do you manage comms of that change? Yes, yeah, it's, it's massively difficult, right? And uh, we don't do ourselves any favor, right? Uh, when it comes to things like name changes, you know, what's an ATP? Well, okay, which ATP are you talking around? You know, Azure, Office 365, Windows. It's 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 a it is difficult, right? And I, I emphasize totally uh, with customers. Uh, I I personally have always prided myself in never getting into licensing discussions, uh, but but that unfortunately that's had to change in the last you know six to six to eight months as I've been working in a slightly different role. Uh, and look, I find it confusing and. And I need to leverage uh, my internal experts to make sure that I'm not misstepping uh, around about our, our capability and, and, and what's included where. Uh, in terms of how I personally uh, advise customers, and look, when, when we work at an enterprise level, and if you are a, an enterprise customer, feel free to, to reach out to me. There's a couple of different sources that, that, that I really utilize personally. Uh, and, and maybe it's just the, the way I work, but I. Uh, one of the one of the one of the first sources I actually use is YouTube, uh, and uh, there is a channel on there called Microsoft Mechanics. Now that's that's that probably feels quite strange. Someone from Microsoft telling you to go and watch videos on YouTube uh, around about keeping up to date with technology, but uh, Microsoft Mechanics is is I guess our it's probably our bridging 
uh, Microsoft YouTube channel, and it sits somewhere between the, the real in-depth technical uh, and uh, and the glitzy marketing edge of of Microsoft, and and it's it's uncovering the real stuff that, that sits behind those product launches and and showing you what's coming down the line, how to implement it. So uh, I hugely recommend uh, I recommend that as a source of information. Uh, beyond that. Uh, our documentation has come on leaps and bounds over the last couple of years. We have made some significant uh, hiring decisions uh, in our, our documentation uh, teams uh, and, and docs.microsoft.com. Uh, I, I refer every single person I work with, both externally and, and internally, to docs.microsoft.com because I, I, I believe the vast majority of questions you could ever have uh, around about what Microsoft technology does, how you implement it, and what the the licensing implications of it are, uh, is available in docs.microsoft. And and based on our acquisition, obviously of, of GitHub, we have integrated them, so you can actually raise uh, you can raise questions directly on docs page. You can you can suggest amendments if elements of it are are confusing or unclear or don't match with what you've read elsewhere. So we're actually seeing, you know, huge amounts of changes on our docs uh, over the last couple of years. It's getting much better. Uh, but beyond that, if you're a if you're a cloud customer uh, at this point and you're on Office 365 uh, or or Microsoft Azure or Dynamics, uh, there are notifications in your your admin center, and you can you can subscribe at different levels and what information you want to come through around about products. Uh, so that does take a little bit of tweaking to get it right for you as an individual or an organization, but that information does flow through there uh, and it is available. Uh, but yeah, I I think Federico uh, touched on it. The rate of change is, is just dramatic uh, when we talk about our cloud technologies. And, and I would say on the security side as well, you know, product naming changes and convention changes aside, the change has to be rapid, right? The change has to has to keep pace or indeed actually be ahead of uh, ahead of the competitive threat out there, ahead of the, the actual uh, you know bad actors uh, who are who are operating globally. So well, we can apologize for for some of our missteps around about uh, things like naming and pricing and licensing. We, I don't think we're ever going to apologize for for actually enhancing and, and, and changing changing those technologies because it's vital that we stay uh, on, a, on an even keel or at least one step ahead uh, of, of those bad actors and hopefully that's uh, hopefully that's answered but I'll, 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 I'll paste in some information into the question on the Q&A as well. Yeah perfect thanks and then we'll pick it up again in the Q&A. Uh, two resources there as well that I, that I wanted to comment on. Uh, the TechNet community is absolutely essential so so you can reach there to the community of people like us but also everybody internally from microsoft is in technet this is free for you guys to join uh, and then you can post questions on whatever technology you have and you get answers from the product owners right so you can jump in there and get an answer from yuri diogenes on any of the security stacks he runs the entire uh, product stack uh, or kobe from israel or visa so so highly recommend uh, checking out technet as well uh, it does take a little bit more work to stay up to date, but uh, similar to what Blair was saying there, I'd rather the problem is how do we keep up with so many new capabilities rather than option B, which is I wish new capabilities were being made available because we want to do all these things, but we don't know how. So so yeah, the lack of documentation is felt sometimes or the lack of clarity on how to implement a new functionality, but I'd rather have to do the extra step of going to Technic and asking the question and then getting into a conversation with the product owner which actually feels more, much more human than just know that I cannot do this. So uh, in, in order to keep moving, uh, we're going to hand over very shortly to David McKenzie, our head of managed services, who's going to go into a hands-on uh, deep dive of Azure Security Center. The One of the things I wanted to catch up, so one of the, before we do that, is is why are we doing this? When, in, in our experience, as we've walked into customers for the last four years, and talked about these different products and kind of tried to deliver the minor services and, and all of the above, we started noticing that there was a lot of overlap between the capabilities that the customer had licensed for versus what the customer was already spending in other technology stacks. So we started doing a lot of simplification consulting where, and again, we don't have an ax to grind here because we don't make money out of Microsoft or any other product vendor. We're not a product reseller. But what we started noticing was that customers were double spending. They were spending on a capability through the licensing they had with Microsoft, and then they were buying 
that capability again outside of the ecosystem. And what we noticed is that most of the times that spend was being done that way because of lack of understanding of the capabilities within the ecosystem, not for an active decision not to use the capability in the ecosystem. So this was kind of a big driver to why we wanted to create these clinics. I believe that there's a lot of stuff that you can benefit from that you're already paying for and that you shouldn't have to go outside of the ecosystem to get unless you choose to voluntarily, in which case, great. But I'm, I'm inviting these clinics to be an opportunity to discuss what products are you do you have available in the ecosystem that you could benefit from today without you having to go buy another license or another product. And then once you've exhausted your utilization of that ecosystem and you still have a residual risk you want to tackle, full on, let's go and figure out what's the best way to solve that problem. But there's so much more that you can usually do with what you already have uh, that, that we as an organization really want to focus on those points. So on that note, I'll hand over to Dave. Dave, I'll stop sharing and I will stop talking and you can take it away with Azure Security Center. Thank you very much, Federico. Hopefully everyone is now seeing my screen. So uh, slightly comedy background, but just to let everybody know we are doing live demos and Azure is being hammered right now because everyone is at home and suddenly doing lots of things. So uh, it's coped remarkably well, but we're going to try and do live demos here. So if occasionally we sit and watch three dots go backwards and forwards, I have juggling balls and a video camera. Uh, Eddie can whistle a tune and it'd be fantastic, but it, it should be fine. Everything's gone swimmingly so far, but uh, in pure live demo tradition, I'm sure it'll explode at some point. Right, Azure Security Center. So uh, we've got a couple of different environments. We've kind of got a, a, a prod environment we use as part of our SOC, and we've got like some demo environments, but this is currently one of our demo environments that everybody can see on my screen just now. And this is Azure Security Center's overview screen. Uh, in terms of what Azure Security Center is, Blair's already mentioned it's like a single pane of glass. Um, and, and that's that's essentially what it is. The idea is that Azure Security Center can be can split down the middle into two things. One's, one half is your cloud security posture management. The other half is a workload protection platform. Now, what that means is that the half of this console is about making sure that you are as secure as possible in, in your on-prem and Azure uh, resources. And then the other half is about the right, assume you're going to be breached at some point. Never assume that you're going to be completely protected forever, right? If you are going to be breached, how are you going to pick it up? So uh, one of the big overlying uh, kind of parts of the posture management is around secure score, where you, you're basically being marked against things. Now, one of the, the big things that everyone is, is interested in is regulatory compliance. And so Along with the basics, you can actually sit there and create an entire policy that says, um, I want to go for ISO 27001. So uh, how am I going to do that? Well, I've got all this technology. Now, normally you go off and do a whole bunch of audits, but Azure Security Center is doing it for you. It, it's, it's already in there. You can create a policy. Azure Security Center is subscription based. So a lot of companies, most companies have probably got more than one subscription but then you tie it all together with Azure group management. And so you can essentially have a tree of policies that goes all the way through. It says every every production subscription must meet ISO 27001 and you can either block things from happening or just report it. Uh, so generally you want to block things, but you can go all the way down to policy levels of that. I want everything to be named in such a, a manner, et cetera. But in terms of your regulatory compliance, you say, well, yeah, I want to do PCI DSS, I want to do a CIS, I want to do ISO 27001. You can actually come straight into this console and actually go and have a look and see how many of the controls you're passing. Obviously, this being a little demo environment, it doesn't do too well against uh, things because if it passed everything, it'd be quite dull. Uh, so uh, one of the, the kind of fantastic things is we can just sit there and go straight in and start saying, right, OK, well, show me what is failing? Why Why am I having problems? So um, uh, as many people will know if you've ever spoken to me, uh, enable MFA. So MFA is deliberately not enabled on here and 
drives me insane because MFA should be enabled in everything whenever you can. But immediately we can sit there and say, right, okay, I have a problem. I've not got MFA enabled on uh, part of my network. Right, okay, I don't have any auditing. But I can sit there and say, right, you know what? I actually have some logic apps that are running that I'm not running the diagnostic logs on. Now, why is that a problem? Well, if you're relying on that as a production environment and you're not logging whether the, the logic app runs successfully or not, that's a problem. Quick fix. We can sit there and go into it and say, oh, OK, right, what would be the remediation steps? Right, OK, I can just go in there and sit and say, and yeah, I want to take my logic apps that are not running uh, diagnostics and immediately click on it and start getting it sending the logs into where it can be monitored. In terms of uh, other things we can see in here, we, we can see that we're all nice and green on there, but in, if we want to sit there and expand any of these, we can sit there and go through each single one and drill down to exactly which workload or machines having a problem, which accounts need to have their MFA enabled on them. We can download it as a, as a CSV and we can ha quite happily click through lots of it. But if we go back to the overview, Secure score is the marking yourself against the, 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 the baseline policy, whether it be a, a, the actual normal Azure security baseline one or a custom one you've made or a 27001 audit. You also have hygiene where we're looking at, OK, how well set up are some of these machines? I'm going to sit there and say, go, right, if I am interested in my networking, I can go off, I can see the actual network map of this network in Azure. I can actually now go and sit there and click on things and say, hang on a second, why have I got an exclamation mark on there? And this machine, uh, which is named Doomed because we leave the ports open to the internet and allow bad guys to hack it and then watch what they're doing. Uh, it's quite rightly saying, oh, wait a minute, what are you doing? Why have you got all these management ports left wide open to the internet? Because I want to. You don't have just in time access. And you go, yes, I know, because I've deliberately set it up that way. I can then sit there and say, right, OK, now start showing me how machines actually talk to each other or other parts of the internal network. Show me the allowed traffic and I can see that actually these machines are allowed to talk to each other. Doom does not allow to talk to anything. Uh, it's just there to be hacked. So if we look at that, immediately we've already got a network map of exactly how things are, 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 are connected. We can actually sit and look at all my individual network uh, uh, NHGs and see if there's any recommendations specifically for them. Uh, straight off the bat, I've suddenly understood way more about my network and all it, all it took was two clicks and 99% of people don't know that, that, that this functionality is there. Uh, similarly, I can sit there and go, what, what about my data and storage? And you sit going, all right, hang on a second, I have some storage that uh, isn't, isn't secure enough. OK, what is it? I can see that this particular storage account is 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 unhealthy. What can I do to fix it? And we say, right, OK, you're it, it's looking for you to start upgrading parts of it. But straight away, I can I can drill all the way through here with with very, very little like investigation. It's very point and click. I can if I had SQL servers in, installed in here, I would be getting I, I could be getting recommendations based on the setup of my SQL server. So if it was prone to a uh, SQL injection, I'd be getting alerts in there saying you should go and do this. You should go and protect this. This account here has got too much access. Uh, in terms of uh, the overall recommendations, yeah, you, you go through these and you think if, for example, MFA, if I had a third party MFA uh, solution that, that isn't the Microsoft one, I can go in and edit the policy and say that it's OK. I can mark that in as an exception so that it gets removed. So you you essentially sit there going, no, no, there is a mitigation in place that, that's not been picked up by this. I'm happy not to score myself badly on that. And eventually what you want is your, your secure score to be 100 um, percent. If we then start looking at taking ourselves a little bit further, so right, like we've locked down our firewalls and, and we've, we've everything's got MFA on it, what can you further secure? That's when advanced cloud defense comes in. Now, now these, these four things are, are, are pretty straightforward, but they're actually like one of the amazing, one of the amazing things about Security Center. 
So adaptive application controls is a very, very fancy way of saying application whitelisting. So if I've got a whole bunch of VMs running on, on this environment, I can sit there and leave this running for like two weeks and then come back and it will tell me exactly every application and every XE that should be allowed to run on that box. Now, having tried to do whitelist down to a, an endpoint level in the past, uh, that's a hard thing. This takes all the hard work out of it and allows you to actually sit and say, you know what, that box there, it's never going to change. It's a production box. Set it up like this and then you have to fire and forget it. And if any other XE suddenly decides to start running on that server, you're immediately alerted as, as, as there's a potential issue. Uh, just in time VM access. So just in time VM access is essentially I've got a whole bunch of boxes. I either need to SSH to them or I need to remote desktop to them. They're in the cloud, but why leave those ports open all the time? So it is all right. I need to be able to access this box on SSH. Fantastic. I want to go and request access or let's look at the activity log first. We have a just in time network access policy and then we can sit and say, right, fantastic. This is exactly what's happening on this box. But in terms of requesting access, I just tick the box and say request access. Now, what's actually happening there is I do, I want that. Uh, I want to do, here's my reason, which is a really rubbish reason. Uh, I don't even need to know what my IP address is. So I'm working from home because, you know, we're all working from home. Uh, I don't need to go and figure out what my home IP address is and then go and get that added into a static firewall rule to allow me to access these boxes anymore. I literally just push this button and for the next one hour, my home IP address will be allowed to SSH to that server. After that, the firewall rule is removed again. It's all done completely dynamically and nobody needs to change infrastructure. It's all just happening in the background. So essentially what's happened is dynamically updating the MSG to sit there and say that my home IP address, 80 odd or whatever, is now allowed to access that box. Now that means that I have access to that. It took 10 seconds to do it. I can now go and SSH to that server without any problem. But now what you have is the SSH being open to the internet be a terrible thing because people will find it and try and hack it. But all of a sudden, I've got this very small pinhole opened for a very for a determined amount of time and then that's it. It's secured again afterwards. So just in time access, you should turn it on and everything. If there is something that uh, a server that's sitting in in your Azure that you 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 need to access from outside just in time, it's one of the recommendations that will keep popping up over and over again because it's so easy, but so few people use it. Adaptive network hardening. So You've already set up your NSG and you say, right, this a bunch of IP addresses need to be able to use this amount of traffic. That's fantastic. But if it turns out you've created that NSG to be slightly too lax, how are you ever going to know that? So if you've allowed a, 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 like 20 different IP addresses to connect to you, but only two ever use it, you would never think to go back and monitor that. But what uh, adaptive network carding is doing is actually going to come back and sit there and say, actually, you don't need all this this open access. Actually, you turns out that you you've opened five ports. You're only ever using three, and you're only ever doing it for these two IP addresses. And so, we'll actually come back and recommend how to tighten up your NSG rules, which is a fantastic thing because quite an awful lot of time people will set something up that they they often will overdo it because they're trying to get it working. Uh, this is immediately going to come back and sit and say, no, no, tighten it up. This is the best way of doing it. File integrity monitoring. That's when we can actually sit there and say, right, okay, for the servers that I turn it on for, so I've got I have my, my servers in there. I want you, oh, I want you to sit there and tell me about every change to critical uh, files and registry. And it's basically keeping a running change log of all the changes that are happening to that DC. And why do I keep doing that when I keep meaning to do that? There we go. So we can actually see that that since that DC was kind of booted up and I applied the policy to it this morning, they've logged into it and immediately some minor registry changes have happened there. But that's just happening all the time. So 
when it comes down to the why is that suddenly broken or what 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 has happened in terms of a security incident, you can actually go into here and see every registry change that's ever happened on that box. And if uh, files uh, in Windows have been modified in Windows, it will jump up and tell you about it. That's Adaptive Cloud Defense. Now, there's like four massively useful tools in terms of like doing the extra securing and making sure that your your, your cloud workloads are safe. Um, nobody ever goes in here. So every customer we talk to, we, we, we go in and say, well, why do you just do this? Is it well, oh, right. And they, they, they don't know any of this stuff exists. So you've got an entire policy framework that you can sit and uh, measure yourself against to, to make like audits go easier. And you've got Dave, an entire- on, on that yeah. comment, there's a couple of questions that we might want to jump into. Uh, do you Go want to it? look at the Q&A? Uh, but they're uh, basically- they're all related to the same. Uh, Okay, no, I, 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 I'll, I'll read them out to you. So yep. they're very related to the uh, other security frameworks. So you used ISO as an example. There's a yep. question around whether CIS benchmarks are covered. But also whether high trust and HIPAA. Uh, so, can you, while you're yes. in that section, do you mind spending a second there? Yeah, no problem. So, if we go into policy management and we want to add more standards, it is NIST, etc., is in there. Uh, there is a section where you can actually start to add more or build your own policy if something's if something's missing. Uh, because we're UK based on here, the HIPAA stuff. It doesn't seem to be popping up, but I have seen it. But uh, yeah, I can sit there and click on the do there. Uh, it is it is easy enough to sit and create your own policy, especially if you want to be if if there if there's something about your workloads that you need some in particular to be to be covered. But yeah, the uh, the actual uh, UK official and NHS ones can go in there and you can actually sit there and go through all the definitions and say right this is everything that's going to be covered and if we assign that to our machines it will then audit all the machines against that um, and you get an, an immediate kind of compliance report against the different audits but yes you can add in compliance standards uh, and you can create your own as well if there's something missing what was the other question or was that uh Similar to Gunnar, there's there's one more that just popped in, uh, mm -hmm. which is around the licensing models of free versus standard. I think we can leave that one to the end before uh, for just for comedy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I I will cover the the. the we're literally about to get to it anyway as we, as we move out of of, of this section. So uh, if we look at price and sentence, let's let's take the question anyway. Uh, there are two. Uh, there's free and there's standard. Uh, what's actually covered is actually dealt with uh, uh, in, in the box. You can get more and it will give you all the individual details. Essentially, stuff like just in time uh, and the, 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 the analytics to, to give you recommendations. At that point, that's the stuff that's going to be covered in, in standard tier, as well as any of the threat protection stuff that we're about to click on. But um, uh, the actual continual assessment and the secure score stuff, that's in there for free uh, and you just have to uh, enable it uh, and get your, your machines uploading to it or connected to it, uh, depending on how you're doing it. In terms of standard, uh, the more resources you have in there that could be charged, like if you had particular storage and stuff like that, then you'll get a, a list in here that, that tells you exactly what you'd be charged per per machine or, or per transaction, etc., to let you know exactly what's happening. You can try all this stuff for free for 30 days. Uh, so you can sit there and spin it all up. There, there's actually resources on the, the things you should try while you're doing your proof of concept. Uh, and certainly we've done plenty of them as well, but you can spin it all up for 30 days and then flick it back to, to free. Uh, you can also uh, turn off individual sections. So if you're only really interested in monitoring your SQL servers, for example, you could sit and turn off the other the other stuff that you don't particularly want. But uh, in terms of it, yeah, the, the threat protection, which we're about to jump into, uh, the just in time uh, stuff that 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 that's covered under the standard. So essentially, fifteen dollars a server a month uh, is is how uh, 
it, it works out as discounts are available. Uh, not that Blair will obviously want me to say that, but yeah, it, de depending on your EA and and the number, then these things are are generally a bit sticker prices, fifteen dollars a month a server. T minus five uh, for your defender DP. So indeed, that's fine. In time. So uh, if we go back to the overview, this is very dull. The subscription because uh, there's no threats now. Threats are not to be confused with Azure Monitor. So if anyone's aware of the Azure Monitor and log analytics and writing rules and stuff in there, that is not what threat protection is here. So to give us a better uh, understanding, here's one I prepared earlier. So here we can suddenly see that, that we've got far more machines coming into this, a whole bunch of old and dirty machines and stuff like that coming into there, but we also have a whole bunch of threats. Uh, and if we flick into here, uh, here is our Bastion server, which uh, is suddenly getting traffic from uh, unrecommended IP addresses. Uh, now, what that actually is, is it's suddenly detecting that uh, four or five weeks ago, we all started working from home and uh, so uh, the IP rate and the IP addresses that commonly hit our Bastion changed. Uh, so in there is literally one person's IP address. Uh, it's a low severity. We know about it. We left it in there because it's a nice, easy thing to, to demo in this. But straight away, Microsoft have said that maybe you should consider blocking that IP address. Now, it's not saying that that IP address is malicious. It's actually saying it's unusual or malicious. Uh, and so over time, for example, that's not reoccurred since the 27th of March because it's realized that actually he is working from home and he is going to be continually doing that. But um, if we uh, do the same thing again, oh, why is that popped up there? And look at our security center. There we go, that's better. We can also then look at a uh, our DNS, it's got 16 alerts in it. And that's because uh, we have a couple of publicly facing DNS servers uh, and everybody wants to have a look at our DNS servers, uh, often places that they we wouldn't expect to want to come and look at us. So we can see that resource and we can see that uh, a whole bunch of traffic from potentially bad places is coming in and we can actually have a look at it and sit there and say, yes, France, we're not expecting people in France to be using our DNS servers, uh, so we could potentially block it and we can go in there and immediately go in. The way Azure Security Center threat management works uh, is based around four different types of alerts. So there's machine behavioral analysis, there's network analysis, which is like we got that uncommon or suspicious connections. We, it can analyze, it can analyze your your resources, stuff like that pass uh, your platform essentially. So it's going to be looking at your your SQL servers and looking for potential SQL injections, stuff like that. But there's also contextual information as well. So if you have a whole bunch of events that by themselves don't necessarily mean anything and they're not massively a problem, sometimes when you tie them together, you go, all right. So if we said right somebody running net group domain admins is a little bit suspicious but an IT guy might be doing it on on the on the ground having a look to see right who's in the admins group if I suddenly ran that from a command shell running the system that doesn't normally run that's immediately bad or you've got a proactive monitoring tool that's uh, doing something a wee bit strange uh, but 99% of the time that that is bad so the kind of fourth contextual one allows it to sit there and say, actually, there's a whole bunch of low level or events of interest and it pulls them all together. Uh, machine behavioral analysis, that can be, it will learn over time a, a, how that machine normally runs and what it normally does. And if that behavior starts to change. So for example, if you suddenly get a whole bunch of DNS lookups for very odd domains that you don't normally look up, it will raise an eyebrow at and then start raising alerts to sit there and say there's something odd going over there. This could be indicative of a command and control uh, connection that, that's, that's trying to make its way out. You should go and investigate. In terms of the 
the other things it's going to do, it's going to do things like if you get a crash dump, so, you know, your machine blue screens, it will actually pick up the crash dump and then go through the mini dump and actually look for any code that's uh, exhibiting potential malicious, malicious behavior. So actually do a mini crash dump uh, check and sit and go through there and actually then alert you and sit and say, hey, that crash was done and this is the suspicious bit of code that did it. If you suddenly got a whole bunch more SMTP traffic coming in than you were expected, it would jump up and sit and say, I think you're, someone's trying to use your spam. Uh, the the actual list on reference of all these is is huge. Uh, so this is the top level. It doesn't really cover a lot of the behavioral analysis stuff, but you can actually sit there and go through. It is it is lengthy uh, and quite often in managed services, somebody will say, how many rules have you got in the SOC? And it's like, that's not really how we like to think about measuring things. But straight off the bat, everyone that's in one of our SOC has got all of these without us raising a finger straight off the bat. And uh, and then you add on top things like looking for stuff that is not normal. But straight off the straight off, you've immediately got a whole bunch of coverage for all of these different things, including uh, on prem Windows devices and Linux devices. It will cover all of that straight off the bat and then you can sit and say right okay well we've got all that data coming in it comes into log analytics workspace we can then do threat hunting of our own so if we then sat and said right okay i am quite interested in a whole bunch of information that maybe microsoft doesn't have yet or i'm not uh, i'm i'm concerned and i want to go and look so I can go and write a KQL query, which is uh, used across all the different products uh, in Microsoft. It's the query language. And I've actually just been given a whole bunch of IP addresses there that I know have been compromised. And I want to know if any of my devices, any of my servers have actually, if these devices have tried to talk to them. Uh, and I can then sit and go, right, okay. And I can suddenly sit and say, right, Oh, hang on a second. This bit of information that literally just landed on my desk, uh, I can see actually that uh, I've got security events that are matching this obfuscated IP address and wired data that's, that's coming in. So I can actually see TCP connections from it and I can go and look at the events. And that allows me to sit and say, actually, these are, these are known compromised IPs that I can sit and go quickly run. I can query everything that Security Center can see. The fact that the agent is bringing up all this information, it's bringing it all in and you can gain a raft of insights around missing uh, null, uh, missing KBs, missing uh, security configs, all the way down to uh, am I getting RDP connections from outside the uh, outside of my environment that I don't expect. Let me let me pause you here for a second. Uh, we are, are, I'll cover some of the log analytics stuff in the Sentinel bit as well. Yep. So we can come back to that in a minute. I guess we can, I wanted to summarize this one a little bit from, from my perspective. And one of the things I've seen usually leads to some confusion. Azure Security Center is not just a signal, right? So, and, and this is the point. We use it in the SOC and it's essential for monitoring. But one of the, one of the key things I want to cover here before we move to Defender is there's a heck of a lot more that ASC will do for normal IT security operations. So A, the compliance part, being able to work with your compliance teams to in real time ways demonstrate compliance against an agreed set of policies is fantastic. And that has very little to do with a SOC or instant response really. The second part in resource hygiene, again, goes much more to IT operations and allows you to ensure that your devices are hardened and configured as you would expect them to be at all times. And then you have the third section, which is the thread monitoring which is where the machine learning and AI elements of Microsoft comes into play to help detect stuff. Uh, and again, as you were saying, that last part is a signal, is an alert, right? And, and then the remediation of that is where things like Sentinel will come into play. So yep. we'll circle back down to that at the, at the last part. Uh, there are a couple more questions, but in the interest of time, I'm going to keep them for the end for now. Can we okay. move swiftly to 
the uh, Defender ATP then, and we I'll sprint through the central part of the end and we can come back and do questions. Cool, right. Um, Defender ATP. So Defender is Defender is antivirus. Uh, Defender is the free antivirus that Microsoft did an amazing thing where they basically included antivirus in the operating system. So overnight, sort of, uh, essentially what happened is that uh, all the all the all those laptops and PCs and everybody's houses that never had a, a working antivirus suddenly got it. Uh, they also then got an absolute ton of amazing telemetry in terms of, of of things that were happening on the endpoints. And when you wrap that all up and and you add in the ability to take machine learning and apply that on a, a cloud base basis, that's where Defender ATP comes in. So uh, Defender the AV. It was originally like signature based, like everything else at the time. It's now a next gen AV. It's it's heuristics behavioral. It's on so many machines on the planet. It's unreal. But when we then start looking at the machine learning, where it can sit in there and look at your environment, it can look at every environment, and then we sit and say, right, okay, let's 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 see what's normal for your users, what's normal for for everybody else, and then start alerting on it. So we're as your security center allowed us to gain a massive amount of insight into what the the servers and and the cloud workloads were happening. Defender EPT essentially starts to give you that to your endpoints as well. So uh, if we if we look at it, we've got threat intelligence and analytics. So we can immediately go up to security operations and then have a look and say, right, oh look, we've got a whole bunch of interesting alerts that were generated yesterday so that we could have things to think about. And yes, we know there's some stuff. We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, we can also sit there and actually look at threat analytics. And for the things that are in your environment or things that might affect your environment, you will actually get a nice little kind of like section of the of exactly how many of your machines could be thingy, but you're secured against it. And then they the executive summary of the look, this is what this sort of threat is and this is how you're covered. If you're not covered or if you've been breached by one of these things, it's up there and it, it, it's in big and red up there. But you get all this fantastic uh, like threat intel on exactly what's happening, exactly what it means, down to a, a, a level that you can present to just about anyone. Um, in terms of uh, other things that Defender ATP is doing that, that nobody's really realizing is there. It's doing vulnerability management as well. So if we go and have a quick look at the threat and vuln dashboard. So we've got a nice big dirty environment uh, here. So we've got lots of plenty of old things and interesting things to see. But we can sit there and say, right, OK, well, that's that's that that's a very similar to secure score It's an exposure score of, of, of vulnerabilities in, in this case i have an entire software inventory of everything on my in estate so if we go into there we can actually sit there and say right i actually have 389 of these we have these this is every single think about everyone every single workstation and every single server in your estate and every bit of software that's installed in it uh, whether there's weaknesses in the software that needs to be updated. Uh, similarly, there's uh, a security recommendations. We can actually sit and say, well, it's like, look, we need to update VM tools, we need to update Google Chrome. Uh, straight off the bat, across all your entire state. Um, uh, so this is like a, a massive eye opener. The number of times we'll actually show people they've got Defender ATP. And think they're just using it as AV, and then you go and say, actually, no, you need to. There you go. You can sit and say, surprise, surprise. You need to update Flash Player. Uh, so we can sit and say, right, this is fantastic background information. We can see weaknesses. We can see uh, all the things that we should go off and remediate in our workstations. Essentially, uh, it does servers as well. The is when you, uh, in fact, when you have as your security center standard tier. Defend, the Defender ATP sensor is included with that. So the, even if you don't have Defender ATP, uh, but you have as your security center standard tier, all your server information will appear in the Defender ATP console that you can go and query in the same way. Uh, in terms of alerts and things, 
a whole bunch of suspicious behaviour suddenly happened on test machines one through four last night. Uh, the test machines had a very bad evening. Uh, so what actually happened it was a simple malicious word document that we dropped onto the machine. The the user in inverted commas opened the, the document and then said, oh yes, of course I want to, to enable the, the, the active content on there. And in the background, PowerShell then tried to download uh, and execute a, a, a machine. Uh, it tried to update the run key, tried to create scheduled tasks. Now we have a whole bunch of alerts in here lots but what defender atp will do is actually take a whole bunch of them and say actually that's an incident so our first one our test machine one which was the initial case the initial one i did it on here's our incident we can have a look at it and sit and say all right it's grouped these nine alerts together and here's the order they came in and i can go and look at the incident page for that and sit and say right okay here's a nice little timeline at 821 word did something then there was some suspicious powershell what was my suspicious PowerShell? Right, OK, here's a whole bunch of right. It was when Word did PowerShell. Here's my command. I can you get the PowerShell command line that was ran. Oh, or I can go and see how many people in the world have PowerShell. It's apparently 1.7 million. Um, but we can set the going. But if we then pick the graph, it'll give us a graphical representation of the actual evidence. So we can sit and say, right, OK, Here's my document. It hasn't been found in virus tool. Uh, we're classing it as a medium alert. You can actually see how often other people have seen it in the world. Uh, we can contact the threat expert to, to ask for information. I can download the file, which is something that we use an awful lot because we like to take malware to pieces and, uh, and analyze it. But yeah, we can then go and retrieve the file um, and, and look at it securely and look at my PowerShell and then say, yeah, that's fine. But straight off the bat, I've got this. It's exploded. Everything that's happened in this incident, I can see the the evidence that that's been kind of gathered by by the investigation. Saying right, okay, there's a persistence method. Oh come on, there you go. Uh, so it tried to play a missile, a malicious scheduled task. Uh, and we can also do investigations now. Automated investigations is a fantastic feature of. Depend HP because what it's actually doing is going off and doing everything that uh, that you would want an analyst to do, uh, and generally doing it a uh, because it's doing it by machine. It's looked at three thousand seven hundred ninety-two different entities, including like a gazillion files, processes, services, and then eventually worked out that there are three particular pieces of uh, evidence we're interested in. I can see the log of everything that was uh, analysed and it will then give you uh, some recommended actions off the back. So we can see here that there's some pending approval, which is the wee pop up that I kept getting earlier. Oh, come on, spinny circle. Hey, okay. so we like to see everything that's happened at any point. I can actually jump in and say I want you to isolate the machine from the network uh, uh, because that there's some there's something wrong with it. Uh, but the pending actions is actually sitting saying right, even though the antivirus on the machine it doesn't have to be defend, it doesn't have to be defender. It can actually be uh, like things like trend, etc. But it obviously works better when you're doing the full defender suite. Uh, we can access it and say, right, OK, off the back of this, it's worked out that actually there is an extra bit of work that needs to be done on that machine, that the antivirus is not being able to remove a particular file. Uh, and in there, you can get a whole bunch of different recommendations. So it'll be that we think you should block this or do that. Uh, so the actual, it'll summarise and say, right, we've got a couple of different alerts that have picked up. It's all been on one machine. I'm not going to cancel investigation, close. Um, in terms of uh, my action center, so that's uh, for all the investigations that are going on. Uh, so we've got three of them sort of thing. We've actually seen that, yeah, we need to do X, Y and Z. It's asking for approval. You push the button, it goes up and it does it. Um, if I, uh, I can see the history of things that have happened with it, but I cleared it yesterday, so it's uninteresting. But uh, in terms of that, all of a sudden you've got an entire automated investigation that will quite happily sit there and take away something that will explode things in the sandbox uh, and try and figure out exactly what's going on. 
all on top of your normal antivirus sort of in inverted commas uh, thingy it'll pick up things that malware that are not being picked up because no signature exists and because it's actually just because it started to, to do behavior that was suspicious um in terms of what we can do in defender atp we can actually sit and go and search all our data for things like urls that have been built in in thingy or particular vulnerability and say show me where that is machines are in there so you can just sit there and say right where is mine so there you go here is my machine uh, and i can now have a look at my machine so i can see the software inventory on my machine my vulnerabilities my timeline my timeline is quite dull because i think i have add icar oh oh no hey, that's everything that's actually happening on the machine alerts is the icar Uh, I've got a whole bunch of security recommendations, which uh, I've deliberately not done so I could do this demo. Uh, but indeed, we can sit there and go through all of these. So there's a whole bunch of policy things in there that we could sit there and go, we should pick that up in an Intune or a configuration kind of policy. Uh, my software inventory, my discovered vulnerabilities, which are a few because I've deliberately not updated uh, uh, Chrome and Firefox and VirtualBox, which are the ones that like to jump up and give you lots of things. Uh, and missing KBs, which there are none. Because uh, I'm happy to have an out of date Firefox for a couple of days, but we're not going to have out of date uh, Windows. But straight off the bat, I can see a whole bunch of stuff about that machine. If I want to then take it further, I can then do more of the kind of advanced hunting. So the same way that we were doing uh, we're doing, in fact, the, the exact same. I'm interested in anything that's been compromised or been talking to something bad. I can run a very similar query, just the kind of table names are slightly different. And I can sit and say, right, show me everything that's been happening on there. And you can sit and say, right, OK, there's a demo machine that F. Chorosky, whoever that guy is, keeps logging into. And it's obviously been compromised. It's not really, it's just Freddy's machine at home. But uh, we can immediately sit and say, right, OK, I need to go and investigate that, that, that IP address. Similarly, if there's other information I want to go and get, I could go and work out a bit of information about my machine. It's not that interesting, but a similar sort of thing that you're going to get there. Where has David McKenzie logged into? Well, I can see there's a bunch of machines in there. How about show me where he's logged on to and when he logs on? OK, all of a sudden I've now got a timeline of like when that user is logged on, whether it was a success or failure. I can even filter. So if I have more than one machine, just show me that one machine. Show me anywhere where there's only been one successful login or there's been a lot of failed logons. All of a sudden I can actually see a whole bunch of data across the entire machine that is a, an IT support guy where somebody walks in and says, where's that person been? That was always a very difficult question to answer. Uh, and now all of a sudden it's actually kind of trouble. My machines run a wee bit slow. I think that there's some Dell thing running on it that, that's, that, that's, that's slowing it down. How often is a process kicking off in my machine that, that involves Dell? All right, OK. I could then sit there and go, you know what? Let, let's show me that process across all my machines and see if it's, if it's causing the same sort of problem elsewhere. If I, I'm particularly worried about vulnerabilities, I could sit there and go, right, OK, well, similar to the kind of panel, I could sit there and go, right, here is a whole bunch of uh, all my software that, that was made by Adobe, whether it's out of date, what CVEs are applied to it and how many machines are affected by it. And immediately I can sit there and go, right, OK. I could also join nearly all of these things together. So I could sit there and say, I am worried about this machine because I think it was breached. Who's ever logged into it and where did they log on afterwards and what did they touch? And you can actually tie all of these things together and get yourself a pretty decent forensic report of exactly what, what has happened in a trail around your network, all by data that's been gathered in there all the time without any problems. You just literally have to learn a little bit of thingy. If, if you can do any bit, any sort of scripting, then KQL is a couple of hours video uh, uh, on Pluralsight uh, for free, and you can get up and running and start being pulling out all this stuff around which commands were actually ran at command line, which, what processes are doing what across your entire environment. Uh, and it's, a, it's an insight into what's actually happening on all your machines. And it's sitting in there 
for nothing that people just think the vendor ATP is their antivirus. Say so, no, no, it's an entire view into your network and exactly what can what can happen. So that's hunting to degree. It's it's more it's not necessarily hunting for vulnerabilities and security issues. It's actually just you can use it for that. You can use it for IT support if if you feel like. Uh, there's a whole bunch of extra stuff in there. You can actually in Defender ATP go and create your own custom detection rules. Uh, so I am interested in running anything that sits and says, you show me if anyone has run net group domain admins or net group. Uh, so you can actually sit there and, and create your own rules to detect things. So I'm interested in, in if, if this process starts to behave in a particular way. You can create a rule and have it scheduled and sit there and, and send you alerts the same way that you get your security center alerts. It can all feed through eventually into Sentinel, which Betty will pick up in a few minutes. But there's a question that I think is interesting as well here. Uh, you might want to jump on it. Uh, hmm. Actually, two of them, uh, which I'd like you to cover if you can. One is whether it covers any DNS traffic uh, and is it is it allowing you to do wire data type analysis? So in, in Azure Security Center, we can collect wire data, which is net flow yep. out of every box. It's something we didn't really discuss a lot. So you can look at all your DNS traffic, you can look at all your queries, you can look at any packet that really leaves through any interface. Do you have an equal ability in Defender ATP? It's not exactly the same, but it's close. Uh, so uh, you can certainly do it. Well, David does uh, that. I invite everybody to keep posting questions and I am trying to answer as many as I can on the published ones. Uh, <laughs> so just keep posting uh, and whatever I don't know. I'll ask David or I'll Google it furiously behind the scenes. <laughs> so uh, network device info is about network cards. Uh, you get in here image load events. There's a whole bunch in here. Uh, is it process events that will end up giving us things? It's not as it's never been as good as 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 wired data, uh, but it is close. You can see things. The DNS resolution stuff is also a little bit odd, both in Security Center and Defender ATP, depending on how DNS works, because many people are now using things like a Cisco umbrella where you're moving your DNS out of your network and it starts to make life kind of complicated. But you can see individual processes and where they're talking to and what URLs, etc. that they're downloading. Uh, it's there. So we can sit there and say, right, OK, let's go and get the remote URL, for example, in there. So device events, I was trying to avoid using it because it's huge, but uh, let's just do it and see what we get. Uh, in the meantime, there. as well, something to keep into consideration when looking at DNS is DNS over HTTPS, which is changing pretty much the entire stack of how DNS works is moving DNS yeah. from a UDP type packet to an HTTP type packet. It just changes the whole nature of protection that came through things like Quad9 or Cisco Umbrella. So, so there's a lot of re-architecting that needs to happen for you guys to get an equivalent sense of security. Yeah. T minus four uh, for uh, us to jump into something. Oh, well, it might take that long for device events to come back, to be honest. Uh, oh, there we go. <laughs> Uh, let's have a look and see what devices we're getting. Uh, we don't want filters. Um, so, yeah, we can see the fact that in the background, uh, Teams and etc. is running. Uh, yeah, the when it comes down to doing this level of querying, you need to be looking for. It's quite hard to threat hunt just without having a plan inside uh, device events. So if you are worried about a particular process or a particular IP address being hit, then yeah, by all means you go and you go and stick it in there and and fire it out. Otherwise, what's going to end up happening is you you are drowned in information because it actually gathers so much and sticks it up there. So it's not as easy to use as wired data in Azure Security Center by 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 a by a, by a long shot. But then uh, the wired data in Azure Security Center is very you're very interested in connections coming in as well because it's 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 workload based, it's server based sort of thing. So uh, the they're not quite there to do the same thing, but uh, you can get a lot of the information out of there. Uh, but uh, you you end up having to do a, a far bigger query sort of thing, or have a very specific thing that you want to look for in mind. 
anything else in there? Uh, so there's one more question that keeps coming up, and I think we'll cover that again. It's most of it, it's about what versions are supported of stuff, uh, and I think I'd like to clarify here on the previous slide and on Azure Security Center. This is not exclusive to Microsoft Azure at all. So although Azure Security Center is a capability of Azure, you can actually use it to protect and monitor uh, pretty much anything. So you can do on-prem Linux and Windows servers. You can do Azure Cloud, PaaS, SaaS, and, and IS components, but you can also do any other cloud provider. So we have customers that are 100% AWS based, and you can draw the connectors to, to bring that data into Azure Security Center. So say you're a multi-cloud company with a little bit of on-prem, a little bit of an Azure, and a little bit of AWS, you can actually extend the coverage across the clouds from ASZ. So uh, talk to us about architecture if you have any questions, and, and we can go and look at things in more detail, but uh, the answer in principle is you should be able to use ASC as your central point of monitoring. And yeah. same from Defender, Defender is not just a Windows 10 uh, exclusive. So it's Windows 7 upwards, and, and David can scream at me if I'm making mistakes, but it also supports Mac OS. So I'm running on Mac, and we have, most of us are, and, and we have Defender ATP installed of our Macs. Yep. So uh, no, yeah. So yeah, Mac, Macs and Macs and Windows uh, for Defender ATP in terms of the ASC agent uh, and and getting data and stuff like in there. The only real restriction you end up having is like 2008 32-bit boxes can't bring in the wire data. I mean, it is it is really that 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 sort of random uh, sort of thing. So anything anything supported by Microsoft right now. Uh, in, in terms of Windows, uh, you can stick an agent on it and, and pull it in. Uh, one thing you probably don't want to do is stick the Azure Security Center agent on every single workstation in your environment, which a few people have asked about in the past. He's like, no, that's Defender ATP. Uh, if you ha if you really had worries about particular machines and you thought that Azure Security Center could bring something that Defender ATP wouldn't bring to endpoint protection, then then fine. But uh, no, you would you would definitely uh, not deliver it out to every single one of your workstations. Cool. Anything else? Okay, that, do the uh, roundup and up? we can jump to yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, there's a couple um, of more questions here. So there's a question about uh, cloud app security. I will touch on it really quickly for Sentinel to show the connector, but cloud app security is a completely different capability. It's a cloud access broker that. Obviously, a lot of these things have things in common, right? So, so we'll cover cloud app security a little bit in in, in just a second, just to say what it does. But then we'll host a whole session on an MCAS because it is a great signal in itself, and I think it's worth discussing. And then Gordon Hope is asking about Azure Blueprints, which is kind of the new templates of policies and resource management that that are available. Uh, uh, do you want to touch uh, Blueprints within ASC, or do we want to leave that for the end? Uh, so you can do a whole bunch of like the configuration management and stuff. Uh, a lot of it ends up being uh, you can report back to uh, report back via ticket to Intune or 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 configuration endpoint manager. Uh, like, like if something's failing to meet a policy, uh, which is a which is a, an, a nice touch. And in terms of the blueprint stuff like that. If if you're talking about the how do I add the ASC agent so that it goes on all the time because I want it everywhere, that that stuff's all handled completely automatically. Deploying ASC uh, into your environment is a session you could you could spend you could spend an entire session doing it, but they make it remarkably easy. Uh, so, uh, but it is a thing. Yeah, the the policy stuff. Yeah, making sure that things are being deployed from a particular template, etc. You could easily do that as well. Uh, but yeah, it's a, uh, it's 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 more around the the, the policy stuff. Uh, in terms of MCAS, you can connect MCAS into your security center, so it picks stuff up. Uh, but uh, you're also going to be connecting it to Sentinel in the next ten seconds. No. <laughs> Should we just jump straight to Sentinel then, and then go for it? All right, you can unshare. I'll share mine. Uh, hand over the baton of trying to pick up the Q and A's as they come in, or, or feel in my way yep. if you don't mind. Uh, I'll share. I'll share my screen too. Okay, so continuing with David's trend of uh, live update. Uh, can I already see this right? Yeah. Nice. Oh, so, so Azure Sentinel. 
Uh, and this should bring us to the final piece of the of this particular webinar um, before we open for full on Q and A. So, if you've been working in the security operations space, you're used to talking about a, a, a scene, and a scene could be Splunk, Logarithm, ArcSight, what Curator, whatever it is that you're talking about. Uh, and then Sentinel was released in RSA in the US last year as general availability. And it is really Microsoft's full on answer to Seam. Although some of the other products that we were talking about, like ASC or Defender, have components of what you need when you're running a security capability, Sentinel really is the, the central hub. It's the, it's the one ring to rule them all. So when you're looking at how do you pull all this environment together, really the, the answer is, is Sentinel. And I think that's, if you look at the direction of travel, you could kind of see where this was coming from a couple of years back. So when we started working with Microsoft in 2016, uh, Microsoft had a product called OMS, Operations Manager Suite, and that's really where, where our story began. What, I, what we saw in OMS was the ability to ingest data, log data or analytics data, in a cloud environment uh, with unstructured data formats to be able to then query it. Uh, it's kind of the basics of what then became log analytics. But but our hypothesis at the time was if I can ingest all that data into OMS and, and, and build the engineering around it to go ask questions off of that data automatically, you have a scene effectively. That, that's kind of the, the, the makings of the basics of a scene. So we did a whole bunch of work to, to develop all the MITRE attack taxonomy use cases and TTPs into Custo query language queries that we could then fire on uh, or mass repositories and voila we had a mitre focused cloud-based SOC delivered by OMS and, and over time uh, as we were closer we showed that to Microsoft we, our relationship started there and then we started looking at what was coming down the roadmap and working with them to not only influence roadmap where we could but also adopt those capabilities as they came out so OMS launched uh, security and compliance, which was a specific tile of OMS, starting to look at some of the things that then became Azure Security Center, like the posture of devices or the health of devices. Then they started releasing the other capabilities such as Defender ATP and ASC. And at that point was when they opened a private preview of a protocol called Azure Security Insights or ASI. Uh, and Azure Security Insights is what ultimately became Azure Sentinel. Uh, we've been working with it for for over a year before it went and when GA. So so by the time it went live, we'd we'd had uh, twenty customers in it. So I think we've accrued over that time a heck of a lot of experience using it. Uh, so let me let me just I'll give you a quick guided tour. Uh, but really, the key is the because of its nature as a cloud scene, what you're getting through Sentinel really is the combination of. A uh, hundred different development streams and a hundred different products all bundled into one. So it's 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 really it's a big beast, and it's becoming a bigger beast as time goes by. We were talking for the rate of change. Sentinel is a li living, breathing beast that is improving uh, pretty much on a daily basis. So I'll try to cover the the basics here, and again we can jump on the Q and A later. Like most seems, one of the key things that you need to understand is Sentinel in itself as opposed to what you get with ASC or what you get with Defender ATP or any of the other products, is not a signal in itself. Sentinel is a place that receives data. Uh, and like all seams, there's a golden rule of if you put garbage in, you're going to get garbage out. It can only work with good telemetry, with good sources of data. And this is where the first thing you need to do when trying to adopt the deployment of Sentinel is look at the data connectors, is what is the data that you can bring into Sentinel to then make available for the rest of the platform. Now, Microsoft supports a heck of a lot of connectors that are out of the box, particularly for things that are traditionally really complicated to ingest anywhere else, like SaaS components. So anything that is SaaS components, Microsoft or AWS, you can pretty much bring natively by clicking two or three buttons. This also brings me to an interesting point on pricing that comes up a lot. Uh, the pricing of Sentinel is based really on the logs that it brings into the, the system. And the logs that it brings into the system are actually not captured by Sentinel itself. They're captured by an underlying piece of infrastructure called Azure Log Analytics or Azure Monitor, now in the latest terminology. 
So when you're deploying Sentinel, really what you're doing is you're deploying a whole bunch of connectors to first bring that data, that telemetry from your on-prem servers, your on-prem controls, from your Cisco switches, from your Palo Alto firewalls, from your CyberArk, from your applications, anything that is syslog-based, you can bring in. Anything that is common event formatting, you can bring in. So you really can ingest pretty much anything. You can also develop your own connectors via API, so you can start bringing data from applications. You, you really can ingest whatever form of data you want, structure or unstructured. And then that data gets stored and, and, and kept in a cloud component called Azure Monitor. And Azure Monitor is what David briefly showed when he was doing that Custo query language query. We'll jump in it in a minute. That ingestion is really where a bulk of the price of this comes in. And that's what you get charged for gigabytes per month of ingestion. And you can then get serious discounts, like 50% discounts if you pre-buy uh, capability. Uh, so so there's, there's, again, this massive discounts you can get here in your environment if you're looking at using this. And then Sentinel is charged on top of your log analytics ingestion. So roughly, if you calculate that on top of your LA ingestion, you add a 20%, that's roughly what's gonna you're going to be paying for, for Sentinel. Again, pricing is a universe in itself. If you then add to this the complexity that if you have Azure Security Center standard tier, the paid tier, then you're paying, you get another discount on log analytics and Azure Security uh, and Azure Sentinel of about 50%. So there's, there's a heck of a lot of complexity here. We're happy to help you navigate that if it becomes relevant to you guys later. But the first rule, go to the rule is you need to connect stuff. Everything that is in green is already been connected. So we were talking before about Cloud App Security. Cloud App Security is a, a SaaS offering by Microsoft. It's a Cloud Apps, the security broker that enables you to understand how people are connecting to cloud services and how people are using identities. It is very related as well to uh, Azure P2. So, so you all of these servers are, are very, very related. But if you if you use MCAS, it provides a really good visibility into how things are being consumed outbound, how what sites are being used. There's some really funky alerts that happened. One of my favorite ones that I've seen come out of MCAS was when somebody we got an alert uh, that said something along the lines of, "By the way, a week ago, a user accessed the site that a couple hours ago was reported as being breached." Uh, so it keeps a lot of that access usage and then is able to go back in time and tell you mm, that service that you used a week ago was fine at the time, but it's literally today been reported as as, 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 as compromised. So you might want to go check that that access wasn't wasn't affected. Uh, super fascinating product. I will cover it in much more detail in the next webinar because I think it's worth uh, it's worth the session itself. Other things that that Sentinel does is which are really important as well is the integration with threat intelligence. So there's two things here. Azure Security Center and Defender ATP already give you the ability to use Microsoft's private threat intelligence feed. And this is done kind of behind the scenes transparently, and you don't really know what's happening. But if you think about it, going back to Blair's screen uh, slides before where he was talking about the investment and the attack surfaces, Microsoft. Microsoft sees more attacks than any other company in the world. And if you think about why, they run Active Directory both on-prem and on the cloud for pretty much any enterprise company that has AD. So they've collected over time a huge collection of, of attributes and, and, and indicators of compromise of what do internal attackers do when doing lateral movement, initial stages of compromise, exfiltration, so on and so forth. And they bundle that threat intelligence feed as a private purchase only through AAC and, and Defender ATP model that then gets transition into Sentinel as part of adopting Sentinel. But on top of having access to that, which comes in straight with the, the licensing, so you don't need to pay extra for that, you then get the ability to integrate your own threat intelligence feeds. So whether you're bringing in open source threat intelligence feeds, or you want to bring in a, a, a one that you create yourself, you can you can bring in as many taxi 2.0 servers as you kind of want, or just point them at the right URL, and you'll be able to bring it in and then use it. We'll use it in a second for, for a demo. Uh, so, going back to data connectors, key thing is then bringing the signals that you need to parse to be able to detect stuff, which then prompts the questions, what signals do I need? And this is where you really need to understand what your threat surface is. We do this through threat modeling, and we encourage everybody to do it through threat modeling, because I think threat modeling is one of the most useful 
capabilities to be able to understand what it is you want to protect. And this also goes back to you don't need to monitor everything. And this is one of the glaring mistakes that I've seen uh, SOC teams make before, where they wanted to bring everything into the software analysis. If you don't have an indicator of compromise that you know you're looking for in that one particular feed that you want to bring in, during the first and early stages of deploying this, the advice is don't bring that in. Only bring in signals that give you value that you know you need. If you're trying to use log analytics as a log storage device regardless, absolutely fine. Check the data in. You'll know it'll be kept there, they're safe. You can retain it for up to 760 days. You can then move it to export it to cold storage. You can do all of that. That's great. But in order to, to leverage the power of a seam and the ability to proactively detect and respond to incidents, really the quality is the, the name of the game here. You want to prioritize quality feeds that give you things that you really want to use to, to detect for stuff. So how do you detect stuff? Well, David kind of covered it a little bit in detail, but let's go into a little bit more detail. Really, what you're using, uh, the, the, the fundamental piece that you need to understand here is Custo query language, KQL. KQL is a semi-SQL, semi-natural language query language that allows you to, to question your data, to ask questions of your data. So, for example, these are the big different data buckets that we're having here, but you can look at all the uh, signing logs, for example, right? So that's a, one type of particular event or one part of particular log. This is the, the logs in themselves, this is the raw data, and literally typing in the, the query in a very simple to use language, it will start querying your buckets of data to go give you access to the raw logs to see what matches your string. I'm doing here, this is not even a query, it's just a dump of what's in signing logs. As you start evolving what it is your queries need to be, this is when Microsoft adopts the term analytic. An analytic really is what we used to call a use case in, in, in soft language. This is your rule definition. This is your, your query definition for each individual thing that you want to alert on. And, and this is where it all begins, right? So, so for example, here we're looking at a brute force attacks against this portal. This over here on the right side, this is the Custo query language. You can open it a bit bigger so you can see it. This is the Custo query language that is doing the logic of finding what, so you can, let me just guide you through the language. You're prompting your signing logs where you're looking, you're bounding your time generation basically to understand what it is that you're, what time frame you want to look for. You're looking for Azure portal type logins, and then you look for the events, successor failures, and the event types in those logs that you'd like to report on. And then you will do the logic to understand whether that's happening over a certain threshold. Every time that that threshold is met and that that data is is it's, it triggers, it will create what Microsoft then calls an incident. So, recapping, analytics are the key thing that you need to develop. You will develop an analytic per type of thing you want to automatically alert on. There's a heck of a lot that come out of the box, but I'm very wary of always out of the box. If you click on rule templates here. These templates have been created by the community. So there's a public community that you can access if you go to the community site here that takes you to the GitHub page where we all collaborate and maintain public repositories of, of hunts and queries and analytics that you can then run in your environment. And as Microsoft identifies the ones that they like the most, they publish them as a rule template for you to adopt here. And literally to, to move any of these straight into production, the only thing you need to do is click on the click on the rules. For example, this is a, a rule that is going to match against a, a particular threat actor called Gallium. You can create the rule and it will immediately allow you to then start detecting for it. You could modify it here if you wanted to, so you can do whatever you want to that rule in terms of changing it, but you can very quickly manage uh, deploy it to production as we're doing now. And in the active rules, that rule has now been deployed and is, is available from now on to automatically detect if any of those IOCs that we were tracking uh, match. The, you can create all sorts of rules here as well for integrating all your traditional Microsoft uh, stuff. So when we were looking at Azure Security Center, you can go to the data connector and connect Azure Security Center to this. You can connect a threat protection, an Azure threat protection to this. You can actually connect Defender ATP as well. 
into this uh, into Sentinel. So Sentinel really is the central repository where you want to bring all your alerts and all your signals from your entire ecosystem uh, into so that you can from this central like pivot point then do all the detecting and instant response activity. Somebody was asking before as well about AWS. There's actually a fantastic blog post to it. We'll follow up. Uh, I'll ask Audrey to remind me. Uh, there's a fantastic, fantastic blog post on how you can use Azure Sentinel to track the Capital One breach. Capital One being a breach that happened in a full AWS environment. Uh, and the fascinating thing was how much how much better, to be completely frank, and, and you'll see it in the blog post, the capabilities that Sentinel gave the teams to be able to go and hunt for that actor, which is an AWS actor, by using the Microsoft tool was, was actually mind blowing. So if you want to see uh, if you're if you're kind of skeptical as to the AWS integrations, I don't don't blame you. Go look at that blog post and, and you'll see it's absolutely fascinating. So we got a bunch of analytics. You define your rules, start small, start with things that you know you want to use. Highly recommend here if don't just deploy rules, use a thread model that you like. Uh, MITRE is a phenomenally powerful thread model tool you can use to go find IOCs. It's really, really good at telling you exactly what the techniques that an actor would use are and what the IOCs would look like. You can define that logic using Christopher query language, create an analytic, and that would automatically, once it finds it, creates an incident. Now, the incidents page is, uh, it's kind of the most, it's the most beautiful part of it. It is also one of the most in development parts of the whole platform, right? So, so bear with it as it changes because it's changing pretty much daily. So uh, here we have uh, an incident that is being reported from Azure, uh, for uh, Azure Identity Protection, IPP2. And, and what you want to do is you normally would just go straight into the investigate, but for the for the purpose of the of the of the demo, let's for just for now click on the view more data. View more data will give you a little bit more data about the entities affected and the accounts affected and the different elements of that incident that you can go and then click through to go straight to the raw data. Now, this is the display name of the account, for example, that is, is part of that one incident that we're looking at. We can then look at the IP address that is that is bound to that one incident, uh, which is over here. But this is very dirty. You're kind of back in the days of uh, looking through logs, looking through the kind of raw text data, which is not ideal uh, in 2020, we should be able to do better. And this is where, where Sentinel has really done uh, an incredible work in, in, in kind of revolutionizing how you can do instant response by creating the, the graphical instant response tab. And the graphical instant response tab is where all the raw data that you have made available to Sentinel uh, is then parsed and analyzed behind the scenes to expose the entities with a really easy to follow uh, graphical diagram and this is interactive and in that I can actually then start to pivot. So this was the alert that I clicked on to investigate the unfamiliar signer activity and these are the two entities that are related to that activity. You have one entity which is the user account and you have one entity which is the strange IP address that that person was logging in from. What's amazing from this is you can then pivot per entity and say for example well that's a strange enough activity but I want to see where if Alice Smith accounts has been related to any other alerts. So you can actually click on follow through and pull on all the other alerts that you might have seen for that user and it will start opening up this image where you can start to see, OK, hold on, maybe something's wrong because that particular user is not just having this one problem, it's also having this two problems. So I want to understand a little bit more about what is this a typical travel. OK, you can then follow through back from here, back to the raw data, and you can start seeing what is it that it's, it, it, it's triggering that secondary alert that you would have probably missed unless you've had this kind of visual platform that would be able to bind all that data together. So in this case, you can see, for example, that was a, 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 a typical locations, uh, and you have something like Leva, uh, Las Vegas to Aberdeer in five, right? So. Uh, literally impossible travel activity uh, happening that, that that enables you to see that something's wrong. You can do this for pretty much any form of asset. So for example, in this case, you want to see what else is that IP related to. You can go and, and, and run uh, all the extended queries 
that enable you to go see if that IP address. So, for example, if if, if somebody else's account had been uh, had been accessed from this IP address, you'd be able to pull it from here, and you'd see exactly the same activity. So. This is a super simple example. I'll try to pull up a, a more complex diagram later, but I wanted to cover in, 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 in really quick terms the power that this gives an incident response team. If you map your, your entities right, and this is the key part, right? When you're bringing the pre-prepared uh, logs that Microsoft gives you in the connector page, the mapping of the value username, the value IP, the value URL, the value DNS name is all done for you automatically. If you're bringing in a custom log for something that is not supported, I cannot recommend enough that you do the true mapping of entity. Uh, so that means you need to specify when you're configuring that log in this log, what is the username if you have it available? In this log, what is the IP address if you have it available? Because that's what how it, it, it operates in the back end. If the entity is not defined, it doesn't just magically pick up that it's the IP address or the username. So defining your log ingestions, going back to the, the first, Getting your data connectors right, properly mapped, properly parsed is key to then be able to do the analytics and the querying and then ultimately raise the incidents. Conscious of time, I have eight minutes left and I wanted to show something else. So the there we saw before that logs is where you where you can have access to your all your data and you can use custom query language to do pretty much whatever kind of query you want. This is also where you can do thread hunting. So if you think about Thread hunting and using thread hunting is just a fancy name for running Custo query languages that are not creating automatically an alert. So I wanted to show, for example, here we we said we were bringing thread intelligence integration. So let's just show uh, what that looks like. This is the thread intelligence feeds that we have. We have a whole bunch of thread intelligence that is loading. So this is uh, each and every line that you're seeing here is a piece of threat intelligence that we're bringing in from a threat intelligence source. So in this case, for example, the threat intelligence feeds are giving us lists of bad URLs, but other feeds are giving us list of bad IP addresses. You can have list of MD5 hashes of files. You you really can can anything that is ingestible by your traditional kind of taxi feeds. You can you can make available for for us to correlate against. So what I wanted to show, I'm going to just jump straight to the the actual example, I'm not going to write the entire thing, is how do you do joining of two different fields? So this query that I very bluntly cheated and copy pasted from a from a left uh, from a from a from a notepad that I have here is doing two things is going to go through the thread intelligence feed and is going to particularly focus on any thread intelligence feed that has given me a bad IP addresses. So I'm going to collect all threat intelligence indicators that go back the last 14 days, looking back at data for the last 40 hours, where I'm going to grab all the malicious IP addresses and I'm going to compare them against my signing logs. So signing logs was the log that I showed before, where I have a list of every signing that happens in the in, in the Office 365 environment. And then I'm going to do a comparison. So when the network IP address of the threat intelligence matches the IP address of the signing logs, then I have had a malicious indicator. So I will run this query. And the result of that query is that I have seen a malicious login. So from the customer IP address, which is 86, that's the malicious IP address, into the signing activity logs of Alice Smith, uh, which is the account that I was trying to monitor. This is a stupid example where I was actually blacklisting my own home IP address and I accessed the, the, the account in our demo environment. But what I wanted to show was the way that you would structure a query to match two different feeds. One, a feed that it gets updated real time, like a list of threat intelligence. Another one, a list that gets updated real time, like your signing logs. All of that being run automatically, in this case, by just running the queries here. But if I wanted to save this, I can immediately then say, well, actually, I like this so much that I want to create an alert for this. And I want to actually keep it as an alert so that every time this fires, I get an incident. So by creating the new alert here, you would be creating a new analytic. Every time that analytic then fires, we we'll create an incident, uh, et voila. You now have your incident response life cycle chained. Now, the last thing that I wanted to cover was the automation perspective. So I said Sentinel is not our product. It's actually a combination of many products. And one of the things I love about it the most is that 
it is making available to people the ability to automate response from the box without having to buy a new product. So where in other products, there's a whole category called SOAR, Security Orchestration Automation Response, where you have things like Simlink, Misto, you have the phantom part of Splunk. Everybody is trying to develop a new product or bring something to market in the space. Microsoft has really done it out of the box in Sentinel through the use of what they call playbooks. Now, again, playbooks is a really simple name for just logic apps. Uh, if you're familiar with the way logic apps work, really, it's it's a Lego brick type component model where you define if this, then that type activity. So, for example, a logic app that we have here is the ability to block users. The way that it works is you go into the definition of the block users. And what it says is when a response to Azure Sentinel is triggered, you will get some of the elements of that trigger that I'll need to be able to make uh, take action on. You will then get the accounts that were particularly affected. In this case, this is a block user, so you will be talking about accounts. And then for each of those, you will go update the user. And when you're updating the user, what you're saying is you're disabling the account. So this is a recipe, right? You will prepare this recipe as a, for some alerts, I will want to go disable users automatically. And then what you do is you can then go to any of your uh, analytics and define that, uh, for example, let's go, this doesn't really matter, it's just for an example. You can define that you can associate that analytic firing to that automatic playbook. So by doing that, instead of raising an incident and the incident sitting there in that queue for an analyst to watch, what this will allow you is as Sentinel detects the, in this case, uh, a user is being brute forced in the account, you could define that automatically Sentinel would go take an action to disable the user's account uh, so that the compromise is, is contained even before it succeeded. Now, obviously, you would define your rules, your appetite here. You might say, well, actually, if there was a brute force account and then a successful, you might want to do that. Or I, instead of blocking the user, I might want to trigger them to MFA again. Or you, your, your definitions of what you can do vary completely, are completely up for grabs, and they're not defined. But that ability to match a recipe to any and every analytic that you create is incredibly powerful in that it allows you to remove a heck of a lot of work that you know that you're taking action on automatically when it happens away from having to have a human a human doing it and moving it straight to the machine to do it. And that is that is the basics of how we try to use our humans to do cool and fancy stuff as opposed to having to wade through stuff that is obviously malicious and that requires always the same behavior when you detect it. Uh, there's more to cover. So notebooks, if, you, if you're if you bored and you have some time, I recommend you go investigate. Notebooks is the Microsoft implementation of Jupyter, and this is where you can define shared environments for automation to be available using the Jupyter language. It's a complex beast. It also requires probably its own half an hour. The one advice I would give if you're exploring this is don't use the free uh, ability to run playbooks for free. Pay for a storage account and run it from your own storage account is going to be a lot more performant. On that note, uh, I'm conscious about time. We're one minute away from half an hour, uh, and I'd like to open a little bit for Q&A and for just general discussion. Dave, is there anything specific for me right now on Sentinel, or should we open for the floor? No, there's. Yeah, I think we can kind of open it to the floor. Uh, one thing, uh, if you are playing with this and you decide to start turning on the, 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 the templated rules, uh, you do need to be careful that some of them are based around user-based analytics. So they're saying in the last two weeks, this has happened. If this happens now, it compares it to the last two weeks. So you'll say, show me anything that's happened today that hasn't happened in the last two weeks. Now, if you go and turn on one of those templated rules just straight after you've done your connectors, what happens is your Sentinel will explode with alerts because every single thing that happens so there's there's quite a lot in there that that, that that are mapping back against history and it's normally very easy to spot them in the templated ones because the history stuff like the the, the the time periods are all set at the top of, of the queries uh you do need to be careful when you turn on some of these things because someone look like oh this is fantastic some suspicious office activity uh, or so a, a high value uh, a azure activity 
those ones are based around what's normal for your environment a lot of the time. So you do actually need to give it a couple of weeks. That's why when we do like things like pox for Sentinel and things like that, is that we turn all the stuff on really early. Uh, and then it's managing the data and then making sure that everything's OK. And then you can turn these rules on and then you'll start getting a, a true sense of the somebody just did something that nobody else in the entire environment has done in the last two weeks. Is that worth looking at? And then you get the alert. If you turn on some of these rules too early, you will get flooded with stuff and you won't understand why it's telling you that someone opened the Word document. Uh, so you can get a really bad view of it because you've just quickly gone in and turned on every rule. So I, I saw a question in the new ones, which is asking whether we're recording and making this available. Uh, yeah, I think we'll make the recording available. We'll definitely make snippets of the recording as well available. So uh, follow up with us uh, if, if you're interested in a particular section. But uh, once once Audrey does clean up, we, we will post this uh, in YouTube for anybody to watch if you need to. Now we covered a lot today. Uh, it's uh, one minute past the hour, uh, past the half an hour at 11:30, which we called as the official closing time. So I understand if people need to start dropping off. If we didn't cover, uh, please do email us, and we can follow up offline with you guys. Uh, I also would really appreciate it if you can send feedback on what you'd like us to see cover next. Uh, we are planning on doing information protection, identity protection on MCAS, uh, but that's off the top of the head. So things we know we want to cover. If there's suggestions for topics you want to see, please feel free. We'll also want to start uh, running uh, events where it are a little bit more collaboratively. Obviously, this was meant to be happening on prem today with all of us together having breakfast and, and being able to to do a bit more back and forth verbally. Uh, it it doesn't really work that well for that in in, in a Zoom conference or in a, in a Teams conference call. So it's much better to to do that uh, on prem. But again, we live under new circumstances, so any feedback you can give us on how to make these better, more compelling, please do, because we'd, we'd love to be able to have value here. Blair, uh, in terms of uh, comments or kind of to top and tail this, is there anything covered that you'd like to stress or anything that we didn't cover that you'd like to stress? Hey, no, yeah, uh, great, great session this morning and, and, and great to see some questions come through as well. Uh, hopefully, Hopefully these continue, I think is, is probably my main comment. Hopefully we can move and, 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 and do a similar deep dive across uh, a number of the other security uh, tools within the stack. And, and you know, I'm, I'm happy to come on and, and support from a Microsoft point of view. Uh, great to see some questions uh, that were e easily answered. Uh, some of them are obviously going to be trickier than others. But yeah, I think the key thing, and, and it touched on some of the points around about Microsoft's either ability or, or, or rather inability to actually keep information flowing through uh, around about what's changing in our security products and what's new and, and what the capability is. I think sessions like this are vital as part of that, right? And uh, I think we, we place a, a great deal of onus and responsibility on our partner network to bring that product to our customers because we can't we can't possibly maintain a one-to-one, -one di uh, you know, direct relationship with every single customer out there that that would be make, using Microsoft technology. So I really do appreciate uh, uh, Quorum Cyber's Cyber's help in this regard. Uh, and look, I'm I'm more than happy to get involved in a, a conversation at any point uh, on these sessions because I actually think that's probably where people get more information and ideas around about how they can enact these technologies within, uh, you know, the confines of what they're trying to do uh, rather than just read it on a, you know, a, a document on a page somewhere and, and trying to make it real for them. So always welcome discussion. Uh, hopefully in the, in the coming months we'll be able to do these in person. And I think that that will ultimately lead to to more face to face interaction and discussion uh, between between groups in the audience. So thank you for your, your time this morning. Uh, I really do appreciate uh, being asked along uh, and again, happy to happy to attend going forward. Thanks for coming. It, it was great having you here. Uh, and for us, uh, we are we are a Scottish company. We're, we're based up here. All the team is up here uh, and to have the support of Microsoft to do what we're doing is, is, is amazing. So thank you. Thank you very much. In terms of the objectives of the day, I really wanted to to make sure that we talked about the capabilities that are there. A lot of these capabilities are already paid for, so people sometimes don't know that Defender is part of E3, that you can then buy the ATP component without having to jump for a full E5. There is value in E5, but there's also value in E3 plus ATP. ASC in itself replaces five, six different products that you might be buying with different licenses. Sentinel in itself is orders of magnitude cheaper 
than than running uh, some other seams because it also includes things like the SOAR element and the log ingestion element. You don't need to pre-buy storage like on-prem. So there's a whole bunch of stuff that has come through frequently asked questions when we're talking to customers that I was trying to make sure we covered today. We probably fail at about 99% of them, uh, but but that's what the conversation is for, right? We don't want this to be us just presenting to you. So please reach out, ask questions. We'll put up, post answers back in social uh, uh, or email or we can jump in a Teams call whenever you guys want. So unless there's anything else, there's one more that I just saw come in and questions as new. No, I think it was just an update to an old one. No, yeah, sorry. There's a question on securing logs if there's time. RBAC uncertainty is clear enough, I think, but there's a is there a best practice for controlling access to the logs in the log analytics workspace? Aha. So RBAC for logs is an interesting conversation. And this is where there's different approaches depending on what you're trying to achieve. So there's RBAC that you can configure, but there's also the ability to deploy different workspaces. And that's sometimes the best way to control RBAC is not just have one workspace and all the data there but actually have separate workspaces for different teams. So for example, if you're running a multinational company that wants to give Australia teams access to the Australia logs and UK team access to the UK logs, you could potentially do things like creating separate log analytics workspaces uh, for them to have access to each individual team more than leveraging the RBAC of the actual logs themselves. I'm going to stop pretending I know what I'm talking about. I'm going to hand over to David to complement with actual knowledge now. Uh, yeah, there is also uh, in preview uh, various uh, ways to control individual kind of table permissions, but uh, it's in, until it appears in 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 the public kind of view, then I tend not to make promises on it because sometimes they could conceivably stay there for quite a while and to try not to do preview stuff in production. But yeah, the 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 best way of doing it is decide what who should be able to see what and then figure out the right okay does that mean that that security that sock can't perform their function then then you need to make a decision as to exactly what should and shouldn't be ingested but yeah having multiple log analytics workspaces to pull in the data into different completely different places where different people have access to is fine you can put sentinel in each of those places there is even in the preview the overarching sentinel that actually allows you to see the incidents from different sentinel works different sentinel instances in one place uh, again it's it's in preview these these like the, the the tool is is constantly evolving uh but yeah uh, things like essentially table level permissions and and even retention uh like changing them the amount of data at the moment retention is set on the workspace and you used to say right okay uh, you're going to get 90 days for free with Sentinel. Uh, in terms of retention, if you need to keep it for two years, then you're going to pay X pence per gig. Uh, but on top of that, you may turn and say, well, actually, but all the performance data, which we've not really touched, and the there's a whole bunch of performance metrics getting pulled in. It's part of the ESC agent pulling it all the way through in the Sentinel. There's a whole bunch of that in there saying, well, I, I don't care how the box was performing three, uh, three months ago. I only care about that for the last week or month but I want to keep all my other data for two years. So the ability to actually be more granular in, in your data controls and permissions is the stuff that's is flowing through just now. OK, hopefully that answers that question. Nothing and nothing new has come in, so I'm going to close doors here. Hopefully it's been a helpful uh, session. Uh, I look forward to the feedback, so please don't be shy. Uh, tell us what worked, tell us what didn't and what you'd like to cover next, and we'll follow up in social media with any updates from this. Thank you very much, however, for attending. Blair, it was awesome having you here. Thank you very much. Uh, I shall see you all in session number two. Take care. Take care, all. Thank you. Thanks, all.